Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, this morning we're going to be running through scripture. So take out your devices or your Bibles and get ready to riff, riffle the pages or flip the screen. Oh, Pastor Jamie, thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. Welcome back, Pastor Jamie and Pastor Tom. Hope you enjoyed your time off. So glad to have you here this morning. And uh, folks, be praying for our worship leader. We have a worship leader who God is going to bring us. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's on, or she is on their way yeah. as we speak. Um, or God is preparing their heart, I should say. So this morning is Easter. And preparing sermons is, you know, it, it takes a fair amount of time. Things have gotten a lot easier over the years. There are a lot of tools that are available to us now. And, you know, we can find references for just about anything online. And there are also software packages that have been developed to facilitate that. Sometimes, though, when you're looking things up, the results that you get aren't quite what you expect. <laughs> When I was preparing for the sermon, I went into one of the software packages and I typed in the search bar the word confusion because that's what the disciples were feeling up until Sunday, weren't they? They were confused. They were confused because what they had witnessed was the betrayal, torture, arrest, torture, and crucifixion of who they thought was to be the Messiah. But when I got the result back, it was somewhat shocking. Because the AI engine in the software returned the word shame. My first reaction was, huh? It seems the artificial intelligence clearly wasn't, right? But then I get thinking. You see, one of the things that you do when you're interpreting the Bible is that you try to enter into the context and culture of the original writers. And in the ancient Near East, like much of the Middle East and high context cultures today, honor and shame are key to their culture. And Professor Michael Garman explains it this way. He says, honor and shame refer to the ongoing attribution or loss of esteem by one's peers, family, social class, city, and so on. In Roman society, this respect was based primarily on such things as wealth, education, rhetorical skill, family pedigree, and political connections. These were the culture's status indicators. The only esteem one has is bestowed not by the self, but by the group. In this environment, peer pressure is not negative or something to avoid, but it's viewed as appropriate and welcome. So the disciples in that culture were experiencing shame in addition to confusion. You see, nothing had gone according to plan. Their Messiah, instead of the victorious monarch that he was proclaimed to be on the Sunday before when he entered Jerusalem, had died the ignominious death of a criminal by crucifixion on Friday, which was the worst possible way to die in the Roman Empire. In their minds, they had backed the wrong horse, and it brought shame on themselves and on their families. They were also afraid that they were next, that they were going to be hunted down, that they would be arrested and dealt with in a similar manner. And they thought that their Jesus now lay dead in a tomb. But then, Sunday. All of the world's history hinges on the birth date of Jesus. And this is something to celebrate, isn't it? But... If you ask me, beloved, that date is roughly 33 plus or minus years too early. See, it's not so important to know when Jesus was born, though it's something we celebrate. But it's the date, time, place of his resurrection that's most important in all of world history. That's when the past is brought to fruition and the future is brought into focus. And even skeptical scholars like Bart Ehrman will agree that not only was there a Jesus, but that he was executed in the manner that the Gospels described. The issue for scholars like Ehrman, the Jesus Seminar, and other 
scholars who are steeped in what is known as a philosophical materialist mindset is that they deny the miraculous. If a claim can't be tested and verified, it can't be true. But that's the very nature of miracles. <clears throat> it's the very nature of the supernatural, that it exists outside of the natural. See, God can't be put in a test tube. And earlier in this series, I pointed out that Jesus was born into the human family ultimately to die for the sins of humanity. That's not the end of the story, though, is it? He died so that he could conquer death. The writer of Hebrew puts, Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 12, verses 12 through 14. But when this high priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus, as the great high priest, gave an all-sufficient sacrifice. He paid the debt of those who had put and would put their faith in him as Lord and Savior. He secured there in our future, even as we all just bumper around in our sinful, all too human flesh all while we're learning to be more like him. And Jesus tried to explain this to his disciples. He spent six years trying to make sure that they understood, I mean, six months, the last six months, trying to make sure that they understood that. But they had been so caught up in who they thought Messiah should be that they missed the point. His victory was not a temporal or political one. It was an eternal, eschatological, or future-oriented one that will be fully realized when he returns. And today in scripture, we have over 300 verses on the resurrection available to us in the pages of scripture. And within those narratives, one of the things that's most remarkable about the resurrection is that all four gospels are aligned that Jesus first revealed himself to women. You see, in first century Judean society, women didn't have agency. They couldn't testify in court. They were segregated in worship. And in comparison to the ideal woman of Proverbs 31, they were kept from participating in the marketplace. Not all four Gospels would record the discovery of the empty tomb by women shows just how important and how countercultural this was. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been journeying with Jesus on the roads he traveled to this point in time. It was about six months earlier that he started this journey. Not because of distance, because it's only about 40 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem. It was because he had to prepare his disciples to carry forward from a point that they would only begin to understand, like most of us, afterwards. And there's another narrative that's found only in the Gospel of Luke, though it's mentioned in certain manuscripts of Mark, that tells a story of two people who were part of the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out to preach in Luke 10. They're on the final road of our series, the road to Emmaus, or the road of fulfillment. Let's look at that this morning and see how Jesus walks with us along the road to which we've been called. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we just, we just come to you this morning and we are just so thankful that you provided the way for us back to you. Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you especially for your resurrection. You conquering death provides a future and a hope for us. These next few moments, Lord, open your word to us and may the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, so we're going to start with a lot of scripture today. Like I said, we're going to read through Luke chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 13. <coughs> it's the road to Emmaus. And I'll start. Now that same day, two of them, and these were the disciples, not the apostles, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. 
See, the Holy Spirit can conceal as easily as he reveals. And it depends on both God's intention and our preparation. Are we ready to receive what the Holy Spirit is going to show us? It's a question that we should ask. Continuing on, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? It's like Cleopas is asking, have you been under a rock? <laughs> the interesting thing about Cleopas is there remains some measure of debate as to whether this is the husband of Mary, the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And unless you get a little confused about that, when we translate foreign names into English, a lot of times we lose the context of that. So it could have been Mary, Miriam, Miriam, and they are all, all translated as Mary. So that's a possibility. Not saying that we know that for sure. Um, and as a matter of fact, in our, in our church network, our Spanish ministries pastor, Yeni, has a sister. Her full name is Yeni Sel. He has a sister, Yeni Isabel. They're from Cuba. So this happens quite more often than we realize. And Jesus goes on and he asks, what things? This is a great technique when helping people through times of stress and disappointment. You get them to explain in their own words what the issue is, and then you start to reframe it. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah, and he is, but his redemption is for humanity, not an earthly kingdom. They still didn't understand this. And they go on and say, and what's more, it's the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. They were unable or unwilling to accept at this point, the things on face value, they were still caught in the events of Friday. And Jesus says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It's not like they were unaware of these prophecies. Not only had they been raised observant Jews, they had spent the last three years with Jesus, who, as we had seen previously, spent a lot of time teaching them. And unless we think that they're dumb by that word that Jesus used, the word he uses is more like unwise or unschooled. They had been presented with information earlier that day they contradicted what they believed. And they were experiencing something that's called belief perseverance, which refers to people's tendencies to hold onto their initial beliefs even after they receive new information that contradicts or disaffirms the basis for those beliefs. And we all do it, don't we? We make decisions based on initial information, and it takes dynamite to blow a hole in that belief in order for it to change. How many of us can look at our Jesus story and say the same thing? We all start from the standpoint, many of us, of disbelief and cynicism. Something changes because we get new information and we process it. So Jesus is processing that information with them. And so as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. He still didn't know who was speaking with them, but they offered hospitality to him, a traveling stranger, which was the norm in that culture. Can any of us imagine doing that today? Someone we just met saying, ah, come on, spend the night in our house. <laughs> no. 
And so when they go in, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. <clears throat> then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to, scriptures to us? How would you feel if this was you? You realize that Jesus had been with you all along and then poof, he's gone. I would be so bummed. It reminds me of that old poison song for those of us who were raised in the 80s. Don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. Right? I mean, there's some people laughing, some people know that song. Some people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so continue on. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two of them told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread, just like he had done three, four nights before, right, at Passover. And from a timing perspective, this encounter with Jesus happens before the evening appearance of Jesus, Jesus to the eleven apostles who were left. Interesting who we would, eat, we would consider to be the most peripheral disciples were the first to see the resurrected Jesus. Other than Cleopas, we don't know the name of the other person. But this is the way of God, isn't it? He doesn't look at things in the way we do. Power and prestige are to be used in service. And those whom the world would marginalize are to be held by the church in great esteem. You can find this in 1 Corinthians 12 and 2 Timothy 2. This is why we take up the cause and we fight for those who are oppressed, other marginalized, and forgotten. Interestingly, Matthew and Mark report that Jesus told the, uh, Mary earlier in the day that the apostles should go meet him in Galilee. But they're still in Jerusalem. Why is that? Well, there's two possibilities. The first was that they were women and they didn't believe what they heard from them. That's possible, but we're going to cut the apostles some slack because if you read in uh, John and Luke Acts that there are later Galilean narratives. So they wind up going to Galilee later, and we'll get more into that around Pentecost. So thing to look forward to. So what were some of the things that Jesus was trying to help the uh, disciples understand? The first was the reason for Friday. Why did Friday have to happen? According to God's word, there had to be a sacrifice. And it had to be sufficient to accomplish his redemptive purposes. And Josh White, I've mentioned him before in his book, Stumbling Toward Eternity, writes this about the cross of Jesus. Scripture declares with repeated force that murderers, adulterers, liars, idolaters, and the sexually immoral, and this list is by no means exhaustive, shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Yet apart from God, and I apologize, yet apart from God and his angels, those are the only people who are invited in and the only people who are there because that's the only kind of people there are. How can it be? This is the golden chain. Jesus is lifted up and people are drawn. As they are drawn, they're exposed. As they're exposed, they repent and surrender to his acceptance. Accepted, they receive the very spirit of the sinless Christ in them. Now hidden in Christ, they are sinners, forgiven despite their sin. New identity, new presence, new power, new purpose, new family, new destination. All are now present in the context of the same old sinner. So yes, while it's true a murderer may not inherit the kingdom of God, there will also not be anyone who inherits the kingdom that is, who is not, in fact, a murderer. So Jesus gives the reason for Friday. Then he talks about the solution of Friday. When he talks about Jesus talks, uh, reveals Moses and the prophets to him, one of the things that he is sure to have 
told them about was Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3, says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took out our pain and wore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus took our deserved punishment on himself willingly. Another thing Jesus is sure to talk to the disciples about is the span of redemptive history that culminates on Sunday. Paul explains it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm going to read from the message translation this morning. There's a nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam. Everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first, then those with him at his coming. The grand consummation when, after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down, and the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid them low, one and all. He walked all over them. When scripture says that he walked all over them, it's obvious that he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the sun will step down, taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. So they go from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. And from there, they go from Jerusalem to Galilee. And from Galilee, they go to Samaria. The other ends of the earth, don't they? So beyond Emmaus, we look at your road and mine. And I have some questions to ask. The first is, what does your road look like? Is it straight and narrow? Or does it meander and have multiple offshoots and even some dead ends? If you're like me, it's more of the latter. Why is that? Well, the simple answer is I'm human. The hard answer is that I'm a sinner. We all are. Romans 3, quoting Psalms 15 and 53, puts it this way. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Thank God that he is gracious, that he's merciful, and most especially that he's patient with us. Amen? The other question is, are you ready to receive what the Holy Spirit is going to show you? We don't want to miss the signs that God puts up along the road. And when you do see one of those signs, don't be afraid to step out in faith if God is calling you to something. We all have a destiny. We all have a road to walk. And if we do it by the leading of God, he'll take us in places we couldn't possibly imagine. The last question is, are you ready to respond to what you've been shown? You're ready to act. Cleopas and the other disciple, you know, they they had walked seven miles from Jerusalem to their home, right? They were probably tired. It had been a long day for them. A lot of stuff went on. And they could have just sat there in wonder and kept this to themselves. But they got up and went right back to Jerusalem to let the other disciples know. And the great thing about that story is you read a little bit further, but you know, 
it's not called out is that they actually got to see Jesus again that evening because they were with the apostles when Jesus appeared in the upper room. So what's he calling you to this morning? For some, God may be revealing himself for the first time. Will you say yes to him? Will you say yes to Jesus? Not to me, not to any man-made structure of religion that requires effort, but simply yes. I need you, Jesus. My life isn't as it should be, and not as it could be. But I know I need him to make sense of it all. I need him to fix what's broken and to reveal what needs to change in my life. I can't do it on my own, but I can take that next right step with Jesus, and all of us can. If that's you today, let that be your prayer. It's simple. Without Jesus, we'll never have the life that God intends for us because we can't do it on our own. But it's not easy because we have to recognize that we can't do it on our own. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Pray for those this morning, Lord, who you're leading. Give them the eyes to see. Give them the ears to hear. That they might hear your voice and listen to your leading. That they might be brought to a place that you have made for them. A place that is better than any they could comprehend or conceive of themselves. And Father, we just ask, Lord, that as we go forward this week, that you would help us to remember that wherever we go, whatever we're doing this week, we're doing it where we are because of and for you and you alone, Jesus. You've given us an awesome opportunity to see you at work in the lives of those around us. Jesus, make us sensitive. Holy Spirit, fill us and guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you would all rise for benediction, today's benediction comes from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Be sure to grab a Papa's egg back there, and I think there's a cake as well. Happy Easter, everyone.